What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, sponsored by peer-run support communities Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to our new broadcast station, KBOO, in Portland, Oregon. Thanks for joining us today. This is Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. Today, our guest is Lisa Darbyshire. Lisa is a psychiatric abuse survivor. She's a longtime organizer with the Freedom Center in Western Massachusetts, and she's an activist in a number of different organizations and movements in the area. And we're going to be talking about her experiences in the mental health system and especially the recovery process and how it relates to diagnosis and diagnostic labeling. So thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio, Lisa Darbyshire. Thanks for having me. So, Lisa, you're an organizer with the Freedom Center. For people who don't know what the Freedom Center is, tell us a little bit about um, the work that's going on in Northampton, Massachusetts. The Freedom Center is an organization for people like myself um, who have some kind of mental health diagnosis, experience with extreme states, or who have experienced some kind of trauma. We work together to find the methods of what is called recovery, that we prefer um, rather than ceding our decisions to the traditional mental health. One of the mainstays of the Freedom Center is a support group that is led entirely by people with some kind of diagnosis and there are no clinicians involved. And there's also yoga, acupuncture, things like this that we can do to create community and help ourselves. I know that July is Mad Pride Month, so we like to celebrate our ability to decide decide how we want to be treated and if we want to be treated by people other than ourselves. We like to encourage critical thinking around medication, particularly polypharmacy, um, forced drugging. I know you have a family history and um, you've been involved in recovery process for a long time, um, which led you to be an organizer with the Freedom Center. Let's let's talk about how things kind of started for you with your, your family, and, and I know that your, your mom was a big influence on things for you. She was indeed. She was a single mother. At some point, she did indeed receive a diagnosis. It got more and more obvious that something was wrong with her. However, I never thought of it as mental illness. She did not take medication, which was hard, but it was also important for me in ways I didn't realize at the time to see somebody who was not in the hospital at all and not on medication. It's arguable about how successful that was, but it was important for me to see because Later, when I had my own experiences with extreme states, recovery seemed not only possible, but pretty much guaranteed if I was willing to put effort into it. And I was. So what kinds of things did your mom go through? How was it that she was behaving or experiencing or suffering that led her to get a a diagnosis? She's very secretive, so it's difficult to tell. Um, I'm pretty sure she already had a diagnosis at this point, but what I saw was someone who would go grocery shopping every day for a month or would crochet a lot. One time she got into dehydrating fruits, and she dehydrated literally 50 pounds of apples. And then, unfortunately, it took a darker turn. One of the more powerful examples Sometimes my mom would try to re- recreate conversations that had happened perhaps years before, and she would recreate them out loud. And occasionally it was in front of me. One time in particular, it was two or three feet away from me for maybe an hour, and she refused to acknowledge me even calling her n- that was disturbing. So these are these are really kind of eccentric things, but I'm not sure. I mean, was she suffering? Was she unhappy? Was she really isolated? Was there ever any kind of mistreatment or neglect? I mean, you're describing someone who's really, you know, unusual and people might say kind of weird, but at what point does it sort of become a crisis or something that's really more um, of a problem? Well, it felt like a constant crisis to me as a, as a young child because she, 
food was not, I didn't really receive food on any kind of regular basis. There was one particular point when she actually did end up in the hospitalization and her house became condemned. It was condemned because she wasn't sort of keeping it up? There was a surprise inspection and she threatened to kill herself um, in front of the cops and she was forcibly hospitalized. Her house was condemned so I came to her house to clean it up. So as a kid you were, she was eccentric and doing these weird things but she was also not doing the things that she needed to do as a mom to, to take care of you. She wasn't making meals for you and she wasn't kind of cleaning the house. and Yeah, my mom was very much a single mother. Um, she had a child very early in her life, and that interfered with her own maturity. Was she really isolated? Did she, she didn't really have friends or family around her to support her or help her? No. There's one thing about my mother that I definitely feel a lot of empathy for. She was definitely the black sheep in the family to such an extent that people really didn't seem to care about her and they didn't seem to care about me as an extension. An example of isolation is the fact that we didn't have phone service for three years. So you say she was the black sheep of the family. Were there conflicts? How was she different in the family? Because that seems pretty pretty important because a lot of the um, the problem here is the, is the isolation. This is a very Yankee family that you're talking about. It's probably because of her mental health problems. No one said anything about it, but people just really didn't want to interact with her. And to some extent, I understand that because it's hard for me to interact with her. Now, as you say, there was a lot of isolation. One wonders if there were less isolation and less stonewalling from the rest of the family, would she have continued to get worse as she did for whatever reason? So she really got shunned for her different behavior, being eccentric. And was she just difficult to deal with on a personal level, like emotionally, just talking with her and interacting with her? Were there things that she and did? Incredibly. Over the years, I saw that she seemed to find comfort in the fact that she, suppose, according to to what she was being told, she had a genetic illness. Therefore, it, she was not responsible for her behavior. So she kind of followed the stigma associated with mental, quote unquote, mental illness, and no one stopped her. When you're a patient in traditional services, you're almost rewarded for your worst behavior. You're rewarded with attention or perhaps even needed care. And so it kind of encourages this race to the bottom. You know, Lisa, I think you put your finger on something really important that doesn't get talked about enough. And it's it's complicated because someone is suffering and they need help. And um, it's really important to be compassionate and caring. But at the same time, the role of being a mental patient, of saying, okay, you've got this illness, it's genetic, it can become something that is learned, that you start to think of yourself in a certain way, and then now you're using that identity to accomplish things or get things done or to make excuses or to explain. She did not want to think of herself as someone who was ill, and so that hurt her. That hurt her... Um, when other people saw her that way, when other people expected her to be that way, because she was she's very intelligent. I mean, she was studying natural resource economics at UMass. Um, that's a difficult subject. Um, she, she didn't want to be seen that way, but then the comfort of not being responsible for your own behavior, which is also a result of being seen as what is called mentally ill, that was that was what she thought was soothing her from the hurt of the the stigma. This is such an important area that we're discussing, and um, I think it's it's dangerous because on the one hand, you know, you you do want to be sympathetic and you do want to cut people slack, and you want to recognize that people may be very 
really limited and not able to take care of themselves or respond or react or or interact in the ways that we would expect them and want them to. And so there may very well be an explanation, whether it's it's trauma or their learned behavior or the circumstance that they're in or just the capacity of their personality. It sounds like your mom was was really shunned and and driven away from the family. Maybe she was overwhelmed. She didn't know how to get help. She has a kid at a very very young age. She's on her own. She's not getting the parenting and family support that she needs. And so there's a tremendous uh, importance of being sympathetic and, and understanding to that. And at the same time, if someone is getting away with things because they're explaining it in terms of, oh, my genetic illness, my disorder, my disease, that's not that's not helpful either. So it's kind of it's a very tricky situation. I don't think it gets talked about enough that mental patients do get put in this role. And it's not to say that oh, it's just a free ride and it's so easy. And it's because it's not like that at all. It's a terrible, terrible dilemma that people get into. But I think it is important that we that we look at this side of that identity of that it does encourage people sometimes to become more helpless and more dependent than they actually are. It it absolutely does. And the most insidious thing that, to bring it back to myself, the most insidious thing I've noticed when I'm personally experiencing it is at every moment, once you have a diagnosis and once you are receiving services of any kind, traditional or otherwise, you always and I hope people can manage to remember this, you always have a choice. You always have the ability to be your own agent in your life. However, the message is so strong, so strong in almost every aspect of traditional services, the message is so strong that you don't have a choice. So the fact that, the fact that you do gets completely obscured and especially when you're vulnerable, when you're in the hospital, when you're experiencing extreme states, when you're on incredibly powerful medications, it's very easy to be encouraged to forget that. And this is one of the key messages of the recovery movement, that at every step, at every stage, at every moment, you have to constantly be encouraging and recognizing that capacity for choice. And whether it's the choice between getting a drink of orange juice or a a drink of grapefruit juice, whether it's the choice of putting your jacket on or putting a a blanket on or very simple kinds of things, that constantly has to be reminded because otherwise the person is going to become dependent and we are going to lose track of our own capacities and which is a the essence of the healing process and the temptation for healers and doctors and nurses and therapists and psychiatrists, the temptation is for them to take the choice away. And well, I I know what's best for you. So I'm going to. And sometimes you have to seize it. I mean, sometimes, you know, you won't, you won't be given a minute to think for yourself. So you have to really seize it. And that's scary. I mean, as you said, it's a constant battle and that's exhausting. The, opportunity to not make your own choices, which I see is virtually synonymous with the idea of genetic illness, that requires almost no effort whatsoever. Yeah, that's really one of the most insidious parts of being told that you have a disorder or that you have a genetic um, predisposition is this sense of helplessness, that that's just who we are, and then it becomes part of us and we kind of give up the possibility for change and the possibility for recovery. Lisa, it sounds like the experience that you had in your family with your mom, she was very difficult and complicated relationship with her own family. And that must have been a, it it was an experience of neglect in a lot of ways, an emotional neglect Mm -hmm. experience for, for, for you as, um, as a kid growing up. And then when did you start to have your own emotional, psychological, or whatever you want to call them, extreme states, experiences that ultimately led you into the into the system? Sometimes it was like visual hallucinations. Sometimes I would see, I walked to school, 
and sometimes in the woods I would see a dead leaf, but I thought it was a dead bird. Um, sometimes I would hear things radically different than from what was actually said. And me being a young kid, I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> it was kind of like my own running comedy show. However, it was also scary because I knew this should not be happening. I, I mean, I didn't, hadn't even smoked a cigarette at that point, and I was essentially on drugs all the time. Were you emotionally in distress? Was it a lot of anxiety or depression for you? Depression. Again, school was kind of like my furlough. So school was relatively okay, as okay as you could expect in my situation. I was probably dissociated a lot. Like um, feeling out of your body and really numb yeah. emotionally and kind of shut down and mm -hmm. kind of just going on autopilot and... Definitely not really experiencing the moment. It sounds like you were learning some kind of protective mechanisms to sort of deal with this very difficult home situation that you were in. It's a way of kind of protecting yourself. I mean, at the time, it didn't feel like I was protected at all. The best way to describe it, um, I've read Malcolm X's autobiography several times, and the way that he describes prison specifically solitary confinement, it's very much the way I felt. Like, I felt like I was in solitary confinement in my own mind. Very, very weird experience. So you were very isolated and had really no emotional connection with other people? I, I lived in the same neighborhood for a long time. So, I mean, I did know some people. But, yeah, you're, you're probably right to say it wasn't an emotional connection. And um, when I was 17, it got really bad. That was right about the time when my mom would talk to herself in front of me and not acknowledge my presence. We actually had a 13 cat at the time, and my mom wasn't great about keeping up with her children or her own personal needs, so you can imagine how that got in a small apartment. Well, that must have been terrible. So I was, I was actually quite obviously from a very dysfunctional home and having experiencing that for a year where all my clothes were dirty that was just unbearable and I, I got enraged with my mother and I I guess I channeled that rage by um, moving out on my own I was able to graduate from Holyoke Community College I, I think I've mentioned before, I, I was learning recovery tools even though I had never heard the word recovery and I did not have a diagnosis. Then I transferred to Mount Holyoke, which is more than I ever expected. That's a private women's college in South Hadley, Massachusetts. That was a rocky transition, so I actually found another recovery tool, which was asking for help, and then that turned into a diagnosis of my first prescription drug. And they put you on Prozac? I tried Prozac for five days, and I developed a full-body rash, and I passed out. Um, then I tried Zoloft for a month, and I literally did not sleep for a wink. Sleep, that's really dangerous. I knew I needed sleep, so I'd lay in bed for eight hours, no lights, no moving, and I still would not sleep. So did the medications play a role in the hospitalization? Yes. I experienced kind of a what might be called a hypomanic state for like eight months. When you say a hypomanic state, people may not know what that means. Like That means I had a lot more energy than usual. I didn't realize it, but I was sleeping less and less. Towards the end of that, I slept three or four hours a night. And this is driven by the medications that you were taking? Yes. Absolutely. So it sounds kind of great in some ways, like you, you know, you have all this energy, but actually it takes a huge toll on your mind and your body, and eventually it starts really, really unraveling you. Yes, it does, and and it unraveled me pretty effectively. So when you went into the hospital, what kinds of things were were going on that were part of your crisis at that point? I didn't really eat much for nine days. I lost like thirty pounds, and my frame is small already, so. I'm surprised I didn't suffer organ failure. I weighed less than 100 pounds, but I still thought I was pregnant and that I had AIDS. That's how I actually ended up in the hospital, because I thought I was getting an AIDS test, which I did. <laughs> but I got a whole lot of other tests in addition. Actually, 
those tests that they took from me, um, my brain chemistry proved to be similar to that of somebody on mescaline. So um, that, that might illustrate to you how out of my mind I was. And that's why I don't hesitate to call it psychosis, because even at the time I knew people I barely knew, if they saw me, they probably ended up in tears. I made a lot of people cry. That's how bad it was. And this was driven by the medication that you were taking, the lack of sleep? Not eating. I remember I did eat a tu- half of a tuna fish sandwich, and it rocked my world. It, probably to this day the best meal I ever had. When I actually was able to eat, it helped immediately. But you were in some kind of extreme state, and so you just had no interest in eating at all. And No interest, plus I didn't think of it. I mean, my mind, my mind was going a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, a lot of people, when they get into that speedy state, that's one of the first things that they lose is, is the food piece. They just are not inspired, not hungry, and don't want to come down, and they kind of forget about eating, and then that just fuels the whole process. I couldn't even tell what time it was. I couldn't even read. I mean, it it was quite extreme. And what was the hospitalization experience like for you? You said you kind of went in under the strange idea that you were getting an AIDS test, and you didn't even really know what was going on, and then you were forcibly hospitalized, and, and what happened? In their patriarchal kind of benevolent, they forced me to sign in as a conditional voluntary patient, which means I have limited rights, but not so limited as a completely forced hospitalization. You know, I've been doing um, advocacy work around human rights in the mental health system for more than eight years now, and this is an area that (laughs) more people need to do some research on this and find out because I'm completely confused there is a a, like a shell game that happens i mean it happened to me in in san francisco where i was put on a so-called open ward at langley porter psychiatric institute but then i was told that if you try and leave we will force you to stay in the locked ward so the open ward wasn't really open at all it was actually a it was an unlocked locked situation basically and um and I was also given the kind of conditional voluntary where you you sign, they, they tell you that you have to sign something. If you don't sign involuntarily, then we're going to force you to be in involuntarily. But then when you sign voluntarily, it's called voluntary, but you can't actually leave voluntarily. There's this, it's incredibly crazy making the circumstances of, of signing in. And I've never understood what the hell is exactly going on? It can't it can't be legal except maybe in some kind of Alice in Wonderland sense of what legality is because of the manipulation of choice that goes on when people sign documents and make an agreement to come in thinking that they have some rights and thinking that they have some power to affect the situation because it's called voluntary, but then it's conditional voluntary. Well, I mean, I could not read. I couldn't even sign my name. I've seen that same piece of paper that I signed, and it doesn't look anything like I've ever written before. Even when you're in an ordinary state of consciousness, it's so complicated, contradictory, Mm -hmm. and the use of language is so manipulative and um, inconsistent that it doesn't make any sense at all. It's like, just I've never been able to, to understand it, even when I'm in my sharpest, clearest frame of mind, much less when you're in a crisis and can't think straight. So not only was I coerced into this one form of action, which I'm not sure was the worst idea. Sounded like you needed a sanctuary, you needed some help, you needed a place to go. What was offered was not uh, really the best. I was really, I blacked out at one point during my admission. Three, five days later into my stay, when I understood that there were different status that you can have, I tried to ask about mine, and they wouldn't tell me. They coerced me into being a conditional voluntary patient, and yet they don't want me to know that. And so in your state of consciousness where you're needing caring, you're needing connection, you're needing some compassion, you're needing really some trust with the people around you, now you're in this incredibly paranoia inducing, coercive, confusing, overwhelming situation that is only going to make your mental state worse, not better, even though the whole point of being there is to improve your mental state. 
and it helped somewhat. However, it was very paranoia inducing, and so was so was the medication that I was on. <laughs> I I was on Risperdal, and I had never heard of the Peer Movement. I'd never heard of the Freedom Center. I had never read any of the books that I've read since then. But within a week. I understood why you would critique medication. That medication did not decrease. It changed the quantity, or I should say, it changed the quality of my paranoia. It did not change the quantity of my paranoia. I remained paranoid for at least two or three months after my admission. But you were more quiet, you were more numbed out, you were more tired. I was more quiet, and actually, though I was more quiet, fortunately, I maintained some of my analytical mindset. There was this friend I made, a long-term friend, that I made at that first stay, and as I was, given, as I was being given my medication in the hospital one day, I was saying to this friend, these drugs make me more complacent. So more manageable as a patient and more co cooperative and easier to handle from the point of view of the institution that you're in. Absolutely. More manageable, more malleable, um, more marginalized. So how long were you in the hospital and what kinds of things happened when you were there and how did you end up getting out of it? I was in the hospital almost three weeks that first time. I was roommates with this older woman who probably spent a lot of her time in institutions. At one point I walked in and she was intimately engaged with herself, <laughs> which was really interesting. Um, well, it raises the issue of what is the logic of putting a bunch of people who are in very different states of consciousness and in distress and suffering, putting them all together and strangers and letting them interact. I mean, people are going to be in conflict. They're going to be disrespecting each other. You have no privacy. I mean, there are mixed gender wards where there's sexual harassment that goes on. I mean, it's a setup for things like what you're describing, your roommate not respecting you like that. Yeah, it's really a, a situation easy to, for people to get re-traumatized or traumatized perhaps for the first time. Within two or three days, once I realized I was actually there, in all fairness, I tried to make the best of it, and I tried to learn as much as possible. After my debut in the emergency room, they found it hard to believe that it was my first day, but it was. <laughs> my recovery began soon after because I was thinking, well, it's been great to see you guys. Thanks for the help. I hope I never, ever see you again. <laughs> I knew very quickly that I wasn't trying to fix what may or may not be wrong with me, but I certainly was going to stay out of the hospital. Unfortunately, I was hospitalized the second time after that, but there's only been two times, which is a little bit of a distinction considering how long I've been experiencing extreme states. I think this relates to the social control aspect of how the system operates because being involved with services and being in the hospital is so unpleasant and painful and traumatizing for so many people. It's almost like certain kinds of behaviors are, are being punished. And so, you know, if you don't want to go into the hospital, you better not tell people that you're suicidal. You better not act so weird in public. You better quiet down. You better hide. You better keep it inside. You better keep it under control or else you're going to go into the hospital. And that is the role that I think institutions and mental hospitals play is certain kind of behaviors, certain kinds of things that happen to people get basically punished by the hospital experience. And then the message and the learning and the treatment is, well, if I want to avoid the hospital, I better change. This is not healing. This is control. This is something that society says that we don't like certain kinds of behaviors. We don't like certain kinds of things to be visible, to be disruptive. And so we want you to be punished when it happens so that the next time you will be more under control and you won't do it again. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. We're speaking with Lisa Darbyshire. She's a psychiatric abuse survivor 
a longtime organizer with the Freedom Center and an activist in Western Massachusetts. And we are speaking about recovery and diagnostic labeling. So how did you get out of the hospital, and then what was your life like after that? Well, I got out because I stopped mentioning that I had had nightmares. <laughs> and um, because, I mean, frankly, I look like an intelligent Yankee, so... They let me out of the hospital. So you started telling them that you were fine and hiding some of the things that were going on as a way of getting out, which is actually really common. That's a lot of people learn how to do that. Yes. And within four months, I stopped the Risperdal. I, at no point did I believe that it would benefit me to be on that for the rest of my life. That's what you had been told when you were inside? Indirectly. No one ever tells you anything directly because that would be respecting you as a human being. But they kind of operate on certain assumptions, and you pick up on them. That you have a disease, and this is the treatment for it to manage the symptoms of the disease. Yes, and um, also that I would undoubtedly be in the hospital again, perhaps very soon. I, I took it. I did take it more than I wanted to. But I took it for four months total, and I stopped abruptly. I just kind of stayed in my house for a few months while I stabilized doing that. Thank goodness I was able to do that because I had a partner at the time. He took care of me. That's a good example of just someone gets lucky that their circumstances, their life circumstances, support some aspect of their process which they can't work or they just need to be taken care of a little bit and some people you have a partner or you have a little bit of money or you have some support from your family and um, you're able to take your life in a totally different direction than people who can't do that and then who end up you know not being able to stay in their house and not being able to get that little bit of support that they need it sounds like you're very fortunate to have that partner I was extremely fortunate, and I recognized that at the time. Uh, the other side of that is I did not have a job, which would be nice. I mean, it was good that I didn't have responsibilities that I had to absolutely had to meet every day. However, it also would have been nice to have something else to focus on. So bring us up to date. So you got off the Risperdal, and then how did things go from there? I was hospitalized the second time. I was put on another antipsychotic, and again after four months, I came off of that. But was it the same sort of crisis spiral? How was it that you ended up being hospitalized again? It was very similar. I was actually psychotic for a similar amount of months, uh, five months possibly. With a the not more. sleeping and the not eating, and yep, and getting triggered. I, it took me a long time to understand what trigger was. I watched a movie called Repulsion, uh, directed by Roman Polanski. That is a very scary horror movie about a woman who descends into madness. And that's a very upsetting movie. Yeah, so yes. Yes, it was, is. Yeah. And I told you about it at a support group one time. That is a lot like my experience with my mom. My mom might have felt similar to the woman in that movie. Wow. So you saw that movie, and it just kind of helped trigger you to spiral down into the not eating, not sleeping, and then... Well, it it, it escalated what had already been occurring. At and that then time. you ended up in the hospital. Yep. But I, by this time, before the second hospitalization, I had heard of the Freedom Center, and I was more, I was galvanized, shall we say, to rededicate myself to more specific tools. I quit smoking marijuana, thank God. I don't think that led to hospitalizations, but it certainly didn't help. Yeah, I think that's something that's not talked about enough is that um, you know, alcohol, marijuana, other drugs can really play a big role oh, in yeah. destabilizing your mind. And maybe they're not the cause, but they're a big factor. You know, So I think people need... There's a strong medicinal aspect to cannabis, and I think a lot of people can get a lot of benefit from marijuana, and sometimes it can be really helpful. But for a lot of us, you know, stopping smoking pot is a really, really important part of getting our heads together and avoiding crisis and hospitalization. Yeah, I mean, my point, and I reached this conclusion through psychosis, neuroleptics, 
otherwise known as antipsychotics, basically do something very similar to my experience with weed, which is they get you to eat and sleep. However, as so many people know, it's not just there are two sides to that coin. I, I see them as very similar. They both have their risks and they both have their benefits. And the risks, of course, of neuroleptics are just astronomically greater than marijuana. We should be clear about that as well, you know. That is definitely my experience. So you were back in the hospital and back in the crisis state, and what happened then? That hospitalization was a lot less eventful. I was just, I I kind of felt shamed in that I was there again. But I also redoubled my, I would, I kind of took my, my recovery. I guess I didn't fully believe in it until that point. That's interesting because I think a lot of people do go through a process of trying to get help from the mainstream system, going to the hospital, getting into problems and turning to the authorities. And then after a while, something really clicks on a deep level. Look, no one's going to do this. I have to do this myself, and I can't just keep relying on the system. And then people start to explore and learn their own recovery tools and their own recovery methods. I mean, I know that's that was basically my process, is that I spent a year trying to get help from the system and just getting mistreated and conf- more and more confused. And eventually, I just was at a point where I'm going to die or I'm going to be completely lost, or I'm going to be returning to crisis over and over again unless I myself start figuring something out. And and for me, it was thinking of recovery not as a pastime, but more of a day-to-day requirement, as I saw you doing at that time when you were here in Western Massachusetts. What are some of the things that you do on a daily basis that are part of your recovery now? Definitely yoga. I mean, in Western Mass, it's a little bit cliche, but it it's when I got past that cliche for myself, it's really essential on levels I can't even describe today. I do have a daily practice in my home, and it helps me on so many levels. It helps me set a daily schedule. It helps me get physical energy out. My my thoughts are more collected. My interpersonal relationships are more nurturing on, on both ends. Was yoga something you discovered through the Freedom Center? Uh, yes. I had certainly heard about it before, but Freedom Center made it much more attainable. Yeah, because we have a uh, free class, and it's very inviting. A free class of people who you know, may not have all the props. It it just made it more real to me somehow. So Lisa, it sounds like your journey of recovery is similar to mine in a lot of ways. And um, just that Mm -hmm. kind of experimental attitude and trying things yourself until you figure out something that, that works for you. And I'm really glad that the Freedom Center was, was, um, playing an important role for you. That's one of the reasons that we created the Freedom Center is to make it easier for people to find resources like yoga that, you know, aren't for everyone, but a lot of people, it sounds like you are one of them, really, really connect with yoga and it can really make a big difference. You mentioned before that your experience of medication has been really more of a control mechanism than anything else. Tell us a little bit about that. When I was first hospitalized and on Risperdal, that same time I mentioned I was feeling complacent, I was asked who was going to vote for John Kerry or George W. Bush. The person who asked me knew I wouldn't vote for either. It said, even though I knew I wanted to vote for Ralph Nader, all that could come out of my mouth was John Kerry, even though I knew I didn't believe it. It was like my own mind was atrophying And, like, this entirely new personality was this, you know, very predictable type of personality was emerging. So the Risperdal made you just go in the direction of the more comfortable Mm -hmm. response rather than a more complicated response that might be more authentic. You were more docile. Oh, it was very much more docile. I couldn't even—I had no memory. (laughs) 
And um, as Utah Phillips, a folk singer who recently passed away, said, oh, how did he put it? The most radical idea in America is a long memory. I think that's absolutely true. And I had none whatsoever. It was difficult to remember from one minute to the next. And that really doesn't make for any kind of critique or even analysis of my own situation. People may have heard of Sans Fanon. Which he, oh, well, actually, he was a psychoanalyst, I believe, from Martinique. And he wrote a lot about colonialism several decades ago. And he described something called the dual consciousness, which mostly he's relating to people of color. And I think the same thing really applies to people um, who have some kind of diagnosis. They are forced to, from my understanding of the concept dual consciousness, they are forced to operate on at least two levels. One being the level that pretty much everybody interacts on, and two being the level of that of crazy, meaning you might you might be interacting with somebody having a conversation about the weather, but there's this other part of you that's thinking, is this crazy what I'm saying? Is this normal? What would I be saying if I were normal? And that takes up a lot of energy. And if the less energy you have, the less able you are to fight for social change or even your own personal change. So it's like a mask that you're wearing that's not really yourself. Uh, yes. Well, at least two masks that you're constantly having to switch between and you're constantly having to refine. In addition to the Freedom Center, I do work with the recovery learning community in Western Mass. Um, and these recovery centers, which there are no clinicians involved, it's all every person that's employed with them has a diagnosis themselves and they're they're doing pretty good work um in addition to organizations like the freedom center which have a little more leeway as far as their opinions i think groups like this need to be started up voluntarily as was the case with freedom center and also have some funding put towards them and also ultimately with my influence in yoga I think the change, the most sustainable change, will occur within individuals. Whether they have a diagnosis or not, I can't emphasize this enough, the same changes can be made in all kinds of people, and there will be benefit for society. If you struggle to believe in the idea that you have a choice every minute of every day, and you encourage others to do the same, and you integrate that into your life as much as humanly possible, I think a revolution will be on the way. Lisa Darbyshire, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Well, thank you for having me again. It was great. You've been listening to an interview with Lisa Darbyshire. Lisa is a psychiatric abuse survivor and a longtime organizer with the Peer Run Freedom Center in Western Massachusetts. Thanks again, Lisa Darbyshire. We have a little bit of time on Madness Radio, so I thought I'd share this poem with you from one of the great mad poets of American history, Charles Bukowski. You know, and I know, and thee know, that as a yellow shade rips, as the cat leaps wild-eyed, as the old bartender leans on the wood, as the hummingbird sleeps, you know, and I know, and thee know. As the tanks practice on false battlefields, as your tires work the freeway, as a midget drunk on cheap bourbon cries alone at night, as the bulls are carefully bred for the matadors, as the grass watches you and the trees watch you, as the sea holds creatures vast and true, you know, and I know, and thee know, the sadness and the glory of two slippers under a bed, the ballet of your heart dancing with your blood, young girls of love who will someday hate their mirrors. 
overtime in hell, lunch with sick salad. You know and I know and thee know. The end as we know it now, it seems such a lousy trick after the lousy agony. But you know and I know and thee know the joy that sometimes comes along out of nowhere, rising like a falcon moon across the impossibility. You know and I know and thee know the cross-eyed craziness of total elation. We know that we have finally not been cheated. You know and I know and thee know as we look at our hands, our feet, our lives, our way, the sleeping hummingbird, the murdered dead of armies, the sun that eats you as you face it. You know and I know and thee know, we will defeat death. That was the poem, You Know, I Know, and Thee Know, by the American poet Charles Bukowski. That's all the time we have today on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.